Rose from Archer Travel, and today we have Mike Archer back on number five of his sales training. How you doing, Hi. Mike? I am well. We actually got some nice weather yesterday and worked out in the yard, and things are going good. So um, today, guys, we are in lesson five, and it goes along with um, Jose's Wednesday training on qualifying, and also because because I concentrate on just the art and the science of, of sales in general. And Jose and Amanda and Archer Travel concentrate on teaching you how to sell travel. I want you to take a look at um, also when you had to, when you started your initial training, you had to go into the back office and, and see a bunch of modules. And in module two of the training videos are actually specific questions to ask about travel. So Amanda, before we get going, would you tell them where to find the module two trainings and also our trainings? Yes. So um, <clears throat> the module two training is in your back office under evolution training program. And then all of Mike's recorded trainings, contact information and bio and manual are all on the... the you go to the back office, the Travel Cafe website, and then you click on trainings and Mike is right at the top. Click on him and you'll get all that information. Yay. Okay. So we have spent the first couple of weeks getting to know our clients' personalities, how they like to be treated. And like I told you before, selling is a relationship business. You cannot be a successful salesperson via social media. It's just not possible because you cannot develop the relationship that it's going to take not only to get a client, but also to maintain a client. 90% of my business after the first five years was maintaining the client base that I already had. Um, when I started, I had zero yearbooks in my territory uh, when I first started. And after five years, I had over 50. And for, the, and for the rest of that time, my 27 years, I built up my existing client base with the people that I had. Plus, slowly over those years, I grew to the point where when I retired, I had 90 accounts that I was working to hand off to some new reps. So uh, believe me when I tell you that none of this stuff happens. This program does not work on social media. This program that I am, that we are walking you through and what Jose is walking you through only works person to person, face to face where you can get to know them. And so lesson five is, okay, now that you've gotten to know them a little bit, now how do you go about finding out what they want? And the thing is, it is asking questions. So I want you to grab your manual. You're in page 20, lesson five. And I want you to go down to the bottom of the first paragraph, and I want you to highlight the last sentence. You control the conversation by the questions you ask not by the statements that you make. Now, remember, early on, I told you in selling in, in the very first lesson that we are taking a trip. You're the driver. I'm the navigator. I know where we're going. You have an idea of where we, you have an idea of where we're going, but you're not sure how to get there. So we can go down I-5. We can go through the Columbia River Valley. We can go down um, the, the Washington, Oregon coast to get to Portland. We can't go however we want, but because I'm the guy asking the questions, I'm the navigator. I know how we're going to get there, and that's how I control the conversation. That's how I direct where the car is going to go. So I want you to remember that and as when you're in your asking questions phase. All right, so there's before you even get there, there's two things that you're going to want to do, okay? Come on, baby. So the first one is the pre-call planning. When you go out on a sales call, 
Do not go in unless you have a clear idea in your mind of what it is you want to accomplish in that meeting. Is your meeting simply that you're going to get to know them? They've contacted you through your website or they've called you or they've expressed an interest in going somewhere. They're not sure where, they're not sure what, but you know what you want to get done. And that is to find out what they want to do and where they want to go. So have a clear idea in your mind if you're uh, of what you want to accomplish in that meeting. If you don't have that, don't go in because you're just gonna fumble around and probably become just a storyteller. So pre-call planning is key. So then the next thing that you do when you get in there is you wanna set the agenda. And there's four parts to this agenda, all right? You're gonna tell them when you walk in, remember, people are looking for, their first decision is whether or not they're gonna to continue to listen to you. And the two things that come into that are, are you compatible with them? Are they gonna to wanna to continue to listen to you? And are you competent? Do you, do you have a clear understanding of your, of your profession? So in your agenda, that's exactly what you're setting out to prove. First thing you're gonna do is say, when you walk in, say, okay, okay Here's what we're going to get done today. This is what I need to know in order to be of service to you. All right. So what do you need to know? Number two, is there anything else I need to know? So this is what I need to know. Is there something that you need me to know that will help us in this process? And then number three, how we will proceed going forward. So you're going to lay out the agenda, not only for that meeting, but going forward, and then the fourth one is, this one's really critical. How much time have you allotted? And then you get their permission. Is that okay? So for example, let's say you walk in and it's initial meet and greet and you're really not sure what's going on. And you go, okay, this is all the stuff that we need to get done today. And this process takes about 20 to 25 minutes. Is that okay? because you need to find out if they're rushed for time or if they're gonna be a little bit more relaxed about it. And if they say, well, I really only have 10 minutes. Now you have a decision to make. Your decision is, can you get what you need to know in 10 minutes? Or can you say, okay, let's spend 10 minutes, but at the end of that 10 minutes, if I don't have everything I need, we will need to set up another appointment. Is that okay? So again, you're, you're getting their permission in order to continue. And by the way, when they say, if that, yes, that's okay, they, are, they have just made the decision that they're going to continue to listen to you. So the other thing is, if you, let's say that you're, you've made a proposal and you need to go back in and make that proposal and you know exactly that it's going to take 30 minutes to do, you need to let them know this proposal, in order to be complete, I need 30 minutes of your time and you and that you set up prior to going in. So when you set up that meeting, when you call them up and say, I've got your proposal ready, I need about 30 minutes, when's a good time for us to get together to make that happen? Then when you go in, you say, okay, um, so for the next half hour, this is what we're gonna do. So you're reminding them that they agreed to 30 minutes. And then all of a sudden, if they say they don't have that 30 minutes, then you know they're going to feel bad and you've got, to, you've got some issues you're going to need to deal with. But timing is key for all of this because it helps the process move forward. Okay, so setting the agenda, pre-call planning. So where we are now, we've established a relationship. And you notice in our triangle, the asking questions phase takes up the biggest chunk of that triangle. Because if you do this correctly, if you ask the questions, you get all the information you need so that you can go back and make a presentation. The presentation and the decision are natural consequences of you doing your homework um, at the beginning during this during this asking questions phase right here, all right? So how do we do that? This is, this is how you manage your time managing the process. Remember the conversational circle, the little engine that could. This is what makes that conversation go. So when you go in, when you go in, chances are, if this is the, if this is the first meeting, you're gonna start off with the question. 
All right, and then you're just going to listen. So what are the kinds of questions? You make a statement. And remember, feedback The last, from last week's lesson, don't forget the feedback. It's crucial in this process, especially right here, because remember, the feedback is letting them know you are understanding them and you're hearing them. So that's the key. That's why you give the feedback. Okay, so the types of questions that we're going to ask start at the bottom, and hypothetical and bridge. So here's the types of questions. So we're going to give you the, I guess, I guess I'm still working on this PowerPoint. I don't have it quite right, but it's better than the last one. So we're going to give you the right question for the situation. And the first one that comes up is the hypothetical, which is what the bridge statement is. Now, a hypothetical question always starts off with if. All right. So if you could do this, if you could do that, and I've got some on the right side of 20, I've got some examples of this. Now, the bridge statement is the very first question you ask, and it's kind of a transition from the getting to know them phase to the actually getting into the selling process phase of asking them what they want to do, where they want to go, how they want to get there. All right. And that's at the bottom of page 20. And it simply is this. Before we begin, so you're letting them know that you're still in the, in the transition. Before we begin, let me ask you about da-da-da-da-da-da. What's your favorite place to go? What's your favorite things to do? If you could go anywhere in the world that you want, where would that be? So if you had an unlimited budget, what would you like to do? Again, these are the kinds of things that I would ask when I went into a yearbook room. I would just go, before we begin, let me, where are you on your status of, the current yearbook this year. What issues are you having? Where would you like help? And, and that kind of thing. So these are the way I would phrase them. And remember, the art of selling is using your own personality, your own words. So don't use mine. So what I would like you to do for homework is Paul is just write out a couple of agenda items and a couple of bridge statements or hypothetical questions. All right. And these are the fun ones because they are wide open and they give you a really good sense of the travel desires of your client. OK, so the next one, these are the journalism questions, the non-directive questions. You want to avoid questions where they can answer with a simple yes, no, because you don't get any you don't get any good information that way. The more you can stick to the who, what, where, when, how. Uh, and why questions, that's going to give you the most valuable information. So those are the, so those are the open questions, the non-directives, the, the journalism. And I've got some examples over on 21. How do you feel about your current income as it relates to your travel plans? Here, you remember, you're trying to get a hold of what their budget is like. And we're going to talk about that in a second. What are your favorite things to do? Um, these questions require more than a yes, no, and that's where you get your most valuable information. Now, here's the key, and I want you to go down to the left column right above elaboration where it says, what talks about our telling tensions on page 21. So our telling tensions are going to, our telling tensions, especially those of you who are drivers and expressives, your telling tensions are going to go sky high because every time they, they something comes out of their mouth, you know that you've got something that they think they're that you think they would get excited about. At this point, I want you to I want you to burn this into your brain. During this phase of the process, you are not selling. Period. End of story. You are only asking questions and gathering information. Your turn to sell comes later. It's their turn to tell you what they want. And as a result, telling tensions are going to start to get high. Your telling tension is going to go up because you get excited, because you know how to sell them and you know what they want, and you've got some really good stuff to show them. And as you start talking, their telling tensions are going to get up, either because they're going to challenge you or they're going to get excited about what it is that you're telling them. So... Remember, the key from last week is you want to avoid lock on, lock out, where they're, they are so locked on 
that they don't hear it. But the key is for you to avoid lock on, lock out. So that's why you're going to go in and you're going to have a notepad. And there's two forms um, in lesson uh, next week's lesson. I've got a form that you can use to take notes with. And also Archer Travel has a form that you can use. Uh, and a lot of you, if you've already, if you've been with Evil for a while, a lot of you probably used it and just sent those forms out uh, on social media, on emails, just say, hey, fill this out and get back to me. Well, that's not an efficient way to use that form. And next week, we're going to talk about how you use those forms. But the key is in the asking questions phase, you are taking notes. This will help you stay on track with the conversational circle. And it will also help you focus on writing down what they're saying so that you can't concentrate so much on what it is you want to sell. That part's going to come in the next phase um, when you actually get to make your presentation. But the journalism questions are the key here. All right. So the next one is called elaboration. These are nothing more than, okay, this is really good. I like what we're going here. Um, but I still don't have enough information. Remember, when you walk in, when I walked into a yearbook room, every time, if I was a new client or, or a new prospect, I had nothing but red flags in my head. And I would slowly turn those red flags to yellow and then finally to green. Elaboration helps you get the yellow flags to the green flags. Wow, that's interesting. Tell me more. Okay, so support and approval, and then tell me more. That's the, that's the, quick feedback is quick. You don't have to really concentrate on feedback. Wow, that's really cool. Tell me some more about that. And that's it. That's your feedback. So um, those of you that are, that are old enough to remember Paul Harvey and the rest of the story, this is exactly what you're doing. Wow, tell me the rest of the story. That's really cool. I want to hear more. And this is important where you use the conversational circle to keep that thing going. All right, so non-directive and elaboration are really, really cool. Reflective questions are, you are simply, if you're not you're really sure what they're saying or they're saying something that's moving away from a sale where you need to acknowledge it. Uh, I've written a couple of, of answers down here. Um, and this is where this is where you can come up um, and, and really help yourselves out without getting stuck. And I'll give you an example. Uh, an example of a, of, uh, a reflective person would somebody would say, you know, I've never really been fond of the MLM process like what you suggest. This is this is if you're trying to recruit somebody for Evo. I've really never been fond of the MLM process. And a reflective question just reflects back to them what they're saying. The MLM process, and then just shut up. Let them explain it. Rather than you fishing around for where, what is in their head, let them explain it to you. The MLM process, and then just be quiet. And remember, everything you're doing is non-defensive. You have to, you're, you're engaging them in conversation and you're trying to get to know them and you're trying to get some valuable information from them. Another one is, I, and I know you're going to get this, um, especially if you're in a complicated program. Well, that looks, that all looks really interesting, but that price is really high, really high. Now, usually when somebody complains about price, they don't have all of the information. Uh, especially, especially this is going to come up, uh, Jose and I've talked about this a lot, and especially this comes up on all-inclusive packages, where it's all in there for the, once they pay their initial thing, there's, there's not another dime to be paid, and a lot of times in all-inclusives, they don't get that, so this is going to be your opportunity when somebody would say, well, yeah, I mean, I still got to pay for the room and the food and I've got to pay for my transportation. And you just sit back and just listen to them and say, okay. And again, if I had something like that, this is where I would throw myself under the bus and go, man, did I really screw this one up? I have failed to tell you all of the stuff that is included in this package, which includes the things that you're concerned about. Now, does this price, after I've explained it to him, I say, now, does this price make more sense to you? 
And so then you can, then you have your go back and you have your interaction. So reflective questions are really, really good when you don't know where to go. And again, it buys you time. So pay attention to that. Um, you don't know why they made that statement. And rather than fish around, just ask them, reflect it back to them. And this, this will save, remember backup behavior and Z out behavior. Reflective questions go a really long way to deflecting the stress and the tension because you are recognizing they have a concern. Well, let's talk about it, whatever it is. So that's where the reflective questions can be really valuable for you. Okay, wit, I call it wit, it's why is that? And this is, this is something where uh, somebody comes in, especially with a strong emotion, somebody might say, man, I hate carnival cruises or I hate princess cruises. And rather, <clears throat> rather, again, instead of reflective questions, sometimes if it's really, really strong emotion, instead of reflective question, use why is that? Oh, why is that? Again, non-defensive. All you're doing at this point is, remember, you are simply gathering information. That's it. So, and, and one of the things you don't want to do, I call it the naked why, which is why I've always used why is that. And this is something that, that Sales Training Institute taught and drilled into us. When you just say, why? See the difference between, well, why? Or why is that? It's all in the tone of your voice, the expression on your face, and how it comes across. Why comes across as a naked why, like you're accusing them of something. That's why I never use it. So uh, again, this is one that you use sparingly and you use it, normally we use it when there's really high emotions involved. All right, hope that makes sense to you. So let's move on. The directive questions, move over to page 22. The directive or the closed questions, these are the questions you need to clarify what you've been talking about. This is the only time you wanna ask yes, no questions is to make sure that you're on the same page. All right, that's the key. So um, you've, you've might through it. So, okay, so we've talked about this, 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 and this. Is, are, is this correct? Is the, are these the things that you agree with? Are, we're on the same page and this, this is all you need is a yes or no answer, all right? So, after, so the, yes or no questions. And these you only use it at the very end. People, time, and money. The three or four most important questions you can ever ask has to do with people. If you miss these, if you miss these, you're gonna lose the sale. People, who was the one making the decision? Now, when, you're, when you go in and you're gathering information, one of the key things you need to ask them, and I always used it this way, because I knew in most schools, the yearbook advisor could not make the decision. It was either the principal, the activities director, or the purchasing agent for the district. So when I was talking to an advisor, I'd always say, okay, in addition to yourself, who else is going to have an interest in the outcome of what we're talking about or in making this decision. You need to find out who all the key decision makers are. And if, you, if it's at all possible to get them into the room when you're actually making your presentation. What you don't want is for somebody to become a gatekeeper where I tell the advisor and then the advisor has to go tell the principal. If I'm making a presentation, I want the principal or the activities coordinator in that room with me when we're, when we're talking about what we can do for their yearbook program. Same with you. When you presented a travel package, uh, husbands and wives are the classic. If you're talking to the wife, make sure the husband's in the room um, when you talk about all this stuff. Now, if you're doing a complicated sale, like a, a family grouping where everybody's spread out, I realize that there are some exceptions to this rule. 
and it, it becomes tough. And so you're going to have to, so you, and you can recognize that you say, okay, I know that there's other people involved in this who don't live in the area. How can we accommodate? How can we get everybody together when we're talking about this? And the simple act is maybe you, you set up a Zoom call if it's at all possible. If not, there are occasions where somebody's going to have to be the gatekeeper and present your program of, to them. So what you might want to do is say, okay, here's the proposal. Who else can I send it to so, so they can be looking at the same thing you're looking at when you, when you guys make this decision? And I'm just going to trust that you can relay all the information that I've given to you. And if there's some questions, have a, have, you know, just have them give me a call and we can talk about it. So as long as you're doing your homework and following up, uh, especially on the complex sales, you should be okay. But for the simple ones, try to get all the decision makers in the room. The next one is time. When are they going to be taking this trip? When are they going to be doing this? So if you're talking to somebody now who's not going to be making the trip until November or December, you need some, in traveling, especially in complicated trips, you need a lot of time lag in between. But like Jose says, a lot of these deals are 24, 48 hours, and then those deals go away. So you need to explain that to them. So you need to make sure, are you are you ready to pull the trigger? If, you, if I present something that you like, are you ready to make the move on this? And can we do this now, even though you might not be going for a while? So people in time, you got to make sure with that. And these all come as part of as, as part of your asking questions phase. And you don't always have to ask these in this order. They, they can come at any point. They don't have to go people, time, money, boom, boom, boom. And in fact, when I was selling, they hardly ever came at, at the same time. I would always talk about the people first. And a lot of the times, I didn't get to the budget part until the very end. How would you characterize your budget? And then for me, it was really easy for me to figure out their budget because I knew what they were selling their yearbooks for and how many books were selling. So that pretty much told me what their budget was for their yearbook. You don't have that luxury. You need to find out how much money are you willing to throw with this or how would you characterize your budget? Now, you know, as you're going through and they're telling you what they want, the reason you have to ask this question is simple. They might have a Yugo budget and a Cadillac dream, and you know you've got an issue. So you're going to have to, especially if they are not experienced travelers, if you're talking with some first-time travelers, they have no clue how expensive travel really is. So you need to explain that to them and say, okay, I know what you want to do, and I know what your budget is. Here, is, here are some issues that we're going to have to talk about, and then just lay it out for them. Show them step by step where their issues are. If you've got experienced travelers, they're going to have a pretty good idea of not only what their budget is, but what they can get for that money. So that becomes a little bit easier. So you're going to, one of the things, you, that's why you asked the bridge statement, you know, how much traveling have you done? You're trying to get a gauge. All of these questions work together to help you when you're doing your people, time, and money stuff. Okay, so if you, if you do not ask these questions, and I'm, I'm not kidding here, if you do not ask these three questions, you are not a salesperson, you are a storyteller. And you, you need to avoid being a storyteller in the worst possible way. The last question is, is there anything else? And this goes as part of your summary statement, okay? So I want you to look at the chart on page 23. So look at, we've established the relationship. So what the summary statement is, we've established the relationship, we've asked, we've, we've asked the questions, and we think we have enough information, but we're really not quite sure. That's where the summary statement comes in. So now at the very end, when you think you have all the information that you need and you're pretty sure all the things in your, all the flags in your head are green, you go to the summary statement. 
And you ask in your mind, do I know enough to make an intelligent proposal? So you ask them the question, is there anything else that I need to know? That's the summary statement. Is there anything else before we go on? Have I missed anything? So if the answer is no, I don't know enough, there are more questions, you go back into the ask questions phase. And you keep doing that, you keep doing that until you, everything comes out to be a yes. And that's where that, that's where this particular interview stops. You say, okay, I now have enough information. I know that you and I are on the same page. I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna prepare a proposal that's gonna knock your socks off. And I need about two days to do that. So when would be a good time for us to come back within the next day or two? Uh, remember, especially if this is a time sensitive deal that we can get down, sit down and, and come to some conclusions and possibly make some decisions. So at that point, um, next week is, we're gonna talk about how you make your proposal and then week seven and eight is present and decide on how we do that together. So remember lesson one, the hidden key to your success and the biggest reason you will lose a sale. Never ever in this lifetime, leave the decision of any, leave the timing of any decision up to the client, never, okay? So that's why you wanna set, when you finish that, you're asking questions phase. That's why you need to set a time to come back right then and there. So what you can do is you can send out your email with the attachment to, especially if it's a big complex um, proposal, you can send out the email with the attachment to the people that are involved and say, we are meeting on such and such a day with such and such person, the one you talk to, well, would you be available either by phone or by Zoom or however you want to do it, but you cannot leave the time? Well, if you send me the proposal, I'll look it over and get back to you. You do that, 90% of the time they don't do it. And I know those of you that have been doing this for a while have experienced exactly that. And the reason I know that is because you're calling Jose and telling them people, people are ghosting you. You don't want to do that. All right, and finally, the other key to your success, and we've touched about this on the five golden minutes as well, or yeah, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? And you're going to know. You will have a really good idea of what worked and what didn't work. What could I have done better? What did I miss? If you have to answer what did I miss, you didn't do the sale, the interview part correctly. All right, so this is this what did I miss? This is, where, this is where you're gonna grow the most because I, I guarantee you, you're gonna go away and go, oh shoot, I forgot to ask him this. So that's when you can do a follow-up email and say, hey, thanks for the interview today. I just realized when I got home, I forgot to ask you this. Can you, can you give me that answer? Did I get a referral? Chances are this isn't gonna happen until the end of the sale. They've either decided to go with you or they haven't. Either way, you need to ask for a referral because that's how your business is going to grow. Wow, I'm really sorry that you that we can't do business with each other, but hopefully I impressed you enough that I know my stuff. Would you know anybody else that might have an interest in what I have to sell? Or you could go, wow, I'm glad you're really excited. Do you know anybody else that might be get, that might get excited? Either way, it's nothing ventured, nothing gained. You've lost nothing in asking the question. And that's how your business is going to grow. And then finally, did I send a thank you note? Thank you notes are key. And there's lots of ways to do it. In my day, it was it was a written one because I grew up back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. So you have to, lots of ways to do it. So, and that's it for today, wonderful people. Uh, Amanda, do, do we have any questions from anybody? Yeah, someone said they had a question, but they didn't type their question in chat yet. So um, if you uh, so at this point, if you want to just reach out to Mike, Mike's phone number and emails are on the Travel Cafe website. We can see your um, whole screen, Mike, if you want to stop sharing. Oh, sorry. 
There you go. So you're full. Thank you. And Thank so you. you can reach out to Mike at archertravel.com. And then what's your phone number again, Mike? 206 979 4249. 979 4249. So give him a call after this webinar, even. Um, he would love to help you guys with any of your sales questions. And remember, Mike is just um, sales, he is not travel but he can help with your scenarios, anything sales. And if you have anything travel related, reach out to us at Archer Travel. Yeah, where I can, where I can help you the most people is if you have a specific question about, well, I did this, I did this, and it didn't work. It's not about, well, I'm, I'm selling this package and I'm not sure how to do it. Those are Jose questions or Susie questions. But if you just have a general question on, well, I messed this up, how can I make it better? Give me a call or send me an email and we can chat about it. That's the kind of stuff I love doing. Yeah, Mike loves helping y'all. So reach out to him. Use him as a resource. Use him as a tool. You have all these resources and tools right at the tip of your fingertips. So reach out to Mike. Use him. And um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, guys. Always a pleasure to be with you. Sometimes I wish I could see you because this isn't my favorite way to teach. My favorite way to teach is to get in front of you and, and interact. So short of that, let's do it by email or phone calls. Okay. Love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.